So you guys thought this was a steelhead tutorial, but I'm actually just gonna sit on this bench and not tell you anything. I started doing this a couple years ago and I will never in my life put on a pair of wading boots ever again. Once I feel like, okay, it's gone too far down there, I don't feel comfortable with that hook set, I have a fish. I have a fish on. So you guys thought this was a steelhead tutorial, but I'm actually just gonna sit on this bench and not tell you anything. Just kidding, I'm on this bench because I started thinking to myself, you know what, over the years we've made all these winter steelhead videos and we've made all these videos and we've never really dove into like the intricacies of what it takes before you actually hit the river. So we're gonna talk about a bunch of the resources that I've used over the years to make myself a better steelhead angler. And the first thing that we're gonna talk about is this thing right here. As the world has continued to evolve, everyone has a phone in their hand. And in my opinion, don't be a hater of it. Just utilize this as tools. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna rip through and show you a bunch of the apps and a bunch of the things that I do. So the first thing that I do before I ever even think about going steelhead fishing, whether I'm in Pennsylvania, Washington, New York, Oregon, it doesn't matter. So the first thing that I ever do is I'm gonna do some research online. I'm going to research the river that I'm going to or the potentially the river that I wanna to go to and I'm gonna research the state. So I'm in Washington state today and so what I like to do, especially right now, we're in early steelhead season, is I'm gonna look up Washington state hatchery steelhead plants. So what I'm trying to accomplish here, oh look, there's the addicted website. And see the first thing that pops up, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, winter and summer steelhead smolt stockings. So you're gonna click on that link. Oh, this phone's really fast, guys. So you're gonna click on that link. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna read what it says. So steelhead smolts are released by state, tribal, and federal regional enforcement officers. And basically what this is, it's, it shows 2022, right? So the majority of these adult returns are expected to return during 23-24 season, which is the season that we're all in right now. And so this is gonna give you a good idea of where to start. So usually guys, the, there's wild steelhead in almost all of our rivers around here, but a lot of those fish don't show up till late. So if you're fishing in November, December, even January, I'm always checking online and figuring out, okay, where did Washington, Oregon, or wherever I'm fishing stock the fish? Because that's gonna be your highest chance at catching one. So you're gonna look on there. It's gonna be really nice. They're gonna have it broken down by region. So you see they got the Puget Sound. If you keep scrolling, I think they have other regions. There's just a lot of rivers in the Puget Sound, but basically they're gonna have it broken down by region. They're gonna have Puget Sound. They're gonna have the Columbia Basin. They're gonna have all the different areas. So you're gonna figure out where you're fishing, and this is gonna be your first piece of information that you use before you even leave your house. Before you even decide to go to a river, do some research online. So once you then pick, okay, you've looked at it and you go, okay, River X gets 200,000 steelhead smolts. That's where I'm gonna go try to catch a fish. The next thing I do is I'm gonna go online and I'm gonna type in River X, and I am going to read as much information as I can find out about this river. I'm gonna look for areas where I can fish from, bank access, as much information as I could find. You're, either, you're probably gonna be able to find tackle information what people use on the river. You'd be very, very surprised at what you can find just by doing a quick little Google search on the river you're going to, and then you're gonna utilize that information when you get to the river to help you catch fish. Okay, so now that you've done all that, the next thing we're gonna talk about is apps. So there is a million different apps that anglers and outdoorsmen use across the whole US, really across the world, to help them be successful out on the river. So I'm gonna show you some of the apps that I like to use. There's three particular that I'm using basically every single day. A weather app, a river app, and I'm gonna show you what that is in a second, and a tide app. Those are the three main apps that you should have on your phone at all times to make sure you're looking at and utilizing before you hit to the river. 
So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, I use Yahoo Weather, use whatever app you want, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna see what the weather's doing that day, just cause I wanna know, I wanna be able to be prepared. Do I need to have my rain jackets? Do I need to have super bundled? Do I need to bring warmers? What do I need to bring with me? So the number one step, check the river or check the weather, see how it's gonna be for that day. Also gonna give you a good indication, like if you check the weather and it says it's gonna rain two inches that day, yeah, probably not gonna be a good idea. The river's gonna be on a hard rise. It's not gonna be very successful fishing out there. So check the weather first. The next app that I use, we're gonna have Alex zoom in on it here. It's called River App. Whoa, don't be look, make sure you blur that out, Alex. You got all my favorite rivers right there saved. So basically what this app does is it has gauges. I have bad service where we're at right now, guys, so you can't really see it, but this app is called River App. It's on iPhone, you can use it on iPhone. But what this app does is it allows you to save. So like on mine, let's see how many I have. I have, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. I have 17 different rivers within my region that I like to fish that I save on my app. And what I do is when I know I'm gonna go to a river, like say you've picked River X, I'm gonna get on the river app and I'm gonna see what it's doing. Usually it'll tell you like the gauge flow, how many cubic feet per second the river's running. That's gonna be very, very important, guys. One of the things as I was growing up steelhead fishing, and this is something that time on the water can never replace. You are not going to learn the most effective times to fish rivers unless you really start to understand cubic feet per second and how much that river is flowing and when to hit certain parts of the river. Something that you can base it off and that I've always kind of used in my steelhead fishing career is if the river's low, fish low. If the river's high, fish high. That's kind of a good gauge to go by, but it's not always gonna be 100% bulletproof. So the only way you can learn this, guys, is start to use this river app. What I did when I first started was I had a notebook. And every time I would go to a river, I would check the river level, I would write down what it was, and then I would see how successful I was on the river that day. As you start to do that, as you get more and more into fishing, You'll start to build a database where you'll know, like I can have a friend call me and say, hey, I'm gonna go fish River X today. And I would tell him, if I was you, I would go fish River Y because River Y is actually flowing at a better level than River X. We're gonna leave river names out of it just cause you know, you guys know it, hashtag no river names. But what it's gonna allow you to do is again, there's not a lot of steelhead guys. Unfortunately, we've come to a time in life where our steelhead runs have been very, very depleted. And so you want to maximize every single bit of opportunity that you can. So if you go to River Y and it's flowing at 20,000 CFS and blown out, you're not going to catch any fish on it. It's going to be really, really, really tough. So that's where this app comes in handy. And they have apps like this for Android. You also can just use USGS. If you type in USGS River Gauge Flows, then you can get all the information from the USGS website, which is a government site where they track river flows to track floods and everything. You can get all the information that you need in the world, and then it's just up to you to start tracking all those river levels and understanding on each river what the best river levels are to fish them. It's gonna help you a lot out there, guys. This That's one of the most important things I learned as I first started getting into steelhead fishing. Okay, the last main app that I'm gonna check on a daily basis is going to be tides. Now you'd be very, very surprised what tides will do to fishing. Now, the way I use it is like, okay, say I'm getting, it's a misconception, right? A lot of people think, oh, fish tend to move a ton on a huge tide. I actually think a lot of times in the lower river, like when they're coming out of the ocean, now granted, I don't have any science to prove this. This is just my fishing experience over the years. I don't think fish move quite near as much on those massive, massive tides because they don't want to use the energy. They don't want to have to blow through a king tide and try to go against the current plus with this massive tide. But where you want to look at tides is say you're fishing a coastal river, for example, right? If you're looking at a coastal river, a lot of times when you get these big fluctuations of say, you know, seven, eight, 10 foot tides, that will actually help flush fish into the system that you can fish on. That's not always gonna be the case. A lot of times if you have higher water or lower water, the tides don't affect it as much. 
but I have guys like clockwork. A lot of times if I see like some of my favorite coastal rivers that I fish, if I see three, four days of really big tides, usually third or fourth or fifth day, quite a few fish have entered the system, just pushed in on the tide from the coast. So really pay attention to those tides. Also, if you're fishing very low in the system, say you're gonna float like a super low stretch, you don't wanna be doing it on this massive incoming tide because a lot of the river is just gonna be backed in from the river just getting flushed in. And it's just gonna look like a bunch of tidal water down there because there's too much of the tide that is pushed into the river. So again, not something that you necessarily have to check every time you go steelhead fishing, but something that you're gonna wanna pay attention to as you become a better steelhead angler. Just check as much as you can, paying attention to those tides, look at what happens during low tides, look at what happens during high tides, and it'll help you immensely as you continue to become a better steelhead and salmon angler for that fact. Salmon, majorly affected by tides, but we're talking about steelhead today, so we don't have to worry about that. But even with steelhead, again, I keep stressing it, pay attention to this information, guys. It's gonna help you, especially long-term as you continue to get better and better at steelhead fishing. So this is the app, guys, that I use for tides. It's called Tides Near Me. It's an Apple app, but there's a million apps you can do. Just what I recommend is just downloading a tide app and having it on your phone so you can check tides on a regular basis. Okay, the next app we're gonna talk about is an app that I primarily use for hunting, but I've really started to use it a lot as I'm fishing, and it's called OnX. And what OnX does is it allows you to see all the public access where you can access the river. So if you're going to a brand new river, you don't know where to fish from, you can pull up Onyx. Don't be looking at all my elk pins here, guys. I'm not gonna zoom in majorly because I don't really want you guys to see where we're at, but you guys get the idea. Basically, it's showing that I'm on the river, and right now I'm in a park, right? I'm in a park, super easy. You know parks are gonna be access points, but basically what it allows you to do, if you look here and you can see all this green, so what this is, if I click on that, Yackel Burn State Forest. Public land, it's a state forest, right? So this app, will help you guys so much at finding access points that aren't private on rivers. So a lot of times what I'll do is when I'm driving a brand new river and say I'm driving a river where it kind of parallels the river and I can drive up it, I'll have my Onyx app open and I'll be paying attention as I'm driving along on where the public access points are where I'm not gonna get in trouble for trespassing. So a lot of landowners are super nice and they don't really care about anglers, but just pay attention use onyx and just use an app that really can make sure that you're not trespassing on someone else's land and it'll help you find all the great access points where you can access the river so another app that i utilize a ton when i'm out there especially when i'm exploring brand new rivers okay guys so that's basically what i use technology wise i highly highly recommend that you utilize technology technology is not going anywhere it's just going to continue to evolve and the more you can take advantage of it the better angler you're gonna be, I promise you. Now, aside from technology, one of the things that Cameron taught me years ago, especially as I started getting into explore mode, you're gonna reach a time in your steelhead career where you've fished a lot of your local rivers, you're comfortable with them, you've caught fish on them, and you're gonna to wanna to go explore. You wanna go hit new rivers, you know, explore new areas, adventure. And so, one of the things that I love to do and that I always do is if I'm going to a new river, I will drive that river on Saturday morning. And let me tell you why that's important. As you drive a river on Saturday morning, you are going to see where every other angler is parked. You're gonna see all the little spots where people like to fish and just take mental notes. Just understand like, oh man, there was 10 cars at that hole or there was three cars at that hole. And just really start to take a mental picture of like, where is everyone fishing on the river? Again, that may not help you the very first time you're there, but as you continue to go back to that river, like say you go on a Saturday morning and then you're gonna go back on Monday when there's way less people, now you have a download of everywhere where everyone was fishing. Super, super important. The other thing I like to do is a lot of times I'll, I'll actually park and I'll go down to one of the community holes. You know, I'll park somewhere where there might be 10, 12 cars parked and I'll walk down with my fishing rod and I'll kind of get in the mix. Not because I necessarily want to fish around that many people, but I want to see what people are doing. So I'm going to take a download. I'm going to look at like, okay, what jig color is that guy using? Are they using worms? Are they using beads? Is this a spoon river? Really start to like, what you're going to find is a lot of these guys have probably fished this river for a while. 
you know, you're going to have a lot of locals, especially on, on those weekend days, everyone's going to be on the river. So any way you can just get little nuggets of information that are going to help you be successful, do it. And driving a river on a Saturday morning is probably one of the best you can do. So I know we talked a little bit about, about information, guys, and using the internet. YouTube. YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. I cannot stress that enough, guys. Not even just Addicted Fishing. Yes, you can go to Addicted Fishing. You can go to the Steelhead playlist. I'll have it linked down below. And we have an insane amount of videos that is going to teach you every technique you would ever want to know about getting out here and going Steelhead Fishing. A lot of really, really in-depth ones. But... Also, there's a million other YouTubers out there that are giving you free information online for you to get on there and do research and understand and learn how to get out here and be successful. So I have to stress it. Obviously, we have a YouTube channel, but just get on YouTube and just type in steelhead fishing. Just watch the videos, you know, look up tutorials, especially if you have specific techniques, like say you want to start spoon fishing, type in how to spoon fish for steelhead, or you want to start learning how to use spinners, type in how to spinner fish for steelhead. I promise you, if we haven't made a video, there's someone else out there that has, and every little bit of information that you could ever want to learn is usually on YouTube. Okay guys, now that we've talked about information and all the things that you need ahead of time before you get out here on the water, we are going to talk about gear. And when I'm referring to gear, I'm talking about all the things that you need to be comfortable out here waders, wading boots, all those little things. So I'm gonna go through the things that I've learned over the years to be a comfortable steelhead fisherman. You know, one of the hard things being out here when you're fishing is it's cold. A lot of times it's raining, a lot of times it's snowing, and you're chasing after these elusive chrome bullets, and it can be miserable, and you could hate your life if you don't dress correctly. And I feel like it's one of the reasons why if someone tells me, oh, I don't like winter steelhead fishing, that is why because they didn't have a comfortable experience when they went out there. So, step one is base layers. So I always like to wear something warm. So I have a 10 ounce hoodie. Don't look at my jeans, those don't count. I have a 10 ounce hoodie, and underneath this hoodie, I'm wearing an Under Armour base layer shirt. Just an extra little piece of shirt to keep me warm underneath this hoodie. So the next thing we're gonna do is on my bottoms, I'm either gonna wear sweatpants, Sims make some really, really nice waiter pants. Those are usually my two biggest options. If you go on Addicted's website, we have a pair of sweatpants that we call waiter pants. Super, super comfortable, and I love to wear them as a base layer. So that's what I'm always gonna wear on the bottom. Now, on my shoes, I always wear Marina wool socks. Again, super, they don't sweat on your feet, but they're really, really warm. So if you can get a pair of Marina wool and you can afford them, I always wear merino wool socks underneath my waders. Another thing you guys can do underneath your wader pants if you want a little bit more comfort is you can also wear the Under Armour base layer of that. You don't have to get Under Armour. I just really like that stuff because it, it seems to keep me really warm. There's a zillion brands out there that make base layer stuff for fishing or hunting that you can get. Again, you can get merino wool stuff too, which is super comfortable, doesn't really get sweaty on you and it'll stay warm while it's wet. So look into that stuff and always try to wear a base layer because it just it's gonna make for a lot more comfortable experience. You'd be surprised how cold you get, especially if you're sitting on a raft. So the next thing we're gonna talk about, I started doing this a couple years ago and I will never in my life put on a pair of wading boots ever again without these toe warmers. Especially if you start fishing in rafts and drift boats, a lot of times you're not moving guys. So you're sitting in that drift boat in the front of the drift boat or the front of the raft and your feet aren't moving. They get extremely cold. So the way these things work is if you look on them, they tell you to actually put these on the bottom of your feet. Not what I do, and let me tell you why. So a lot of times you're gonna notice when I talk about wader boots, they have typically a good wader boot is gonna have a very big toe. You wanna have a lot of room in your toe to move those toes around get circulation in them to keep them warm. So always look for a nice wader boot that has a big toe. Again, we're not sponsored by Sims. Those guys have supported us for years. So I use a lot of Sims wading boots. One of the reasons that I love Sims over a lot of the other brands is this system right here. This is called a star cleat system. You can see these little star cleats that are in each part of my waders. I'm not joking guys, these are like freaking magnets to the rocks. 
Now, granted, I haven't tried a lot of other brands. I'm sure Corkers makes an amazing wading boot. I hear a lot of people talking about them. I'm sure there's a lot of other companies that make amazing wading boots. Just go try on a bunch of different pairs, figure out which ones you like the best, but always make sure that you have a nice big toe. And that's where these are gonna make sense here in just a second. The other thing that you want with wader boots that's really, really, really important. So the next thing we're gonna talk about with wading boots before we get into the toe warmers, always buy one size bigger than what you think you are. So if you wear a size 10 in shoes, buy a size 11 in wading boots. And here's why. You're gonna have your neoprene footies on. You're typically gonna be wearing thick socks. You trust me, get one size bigger always. So buy one size bigger. The other thing that you can do is just check the sizing chart on the wading boots, whoever you're buying them. Just make sure you're checking the sizing chart and always err on bigger than smaller. Trust me on that. Okay. So with these toe things, normally they tell you to put these things on the bottom of your feet. I am almost never going to do that. What I always do is I'm going to put these on the top of my feet. So I typically will put them just like this. This is before I even put my waders on. You're gonna put them right onto the sock. They have a little bit of stickiness to them. You just put them right on your sock. Just like that. You're gonna put those on both feet way before you even put your wading boots on. And what that's gonna do is those things are gonna get super toasty and I promise you they're gonna keep your feet warm. I literally will not go winter steelhead fishing without these toe warmers on my feet. It's like a game changer for me. Okay, the next most important thing guys is waders. So there is about 500 different wader manufacturers. Everyone has an opinion of who makes the best. You have Reddington, you have Drift, you have Sims, you have Aquas, you have Patagonia, absolutely don't buy those. You have, I can't even think of all the other brands. You have High Lift. I mean, there's, there's so many different wader brands out there. Here's the most important thing. Do not go cheap on your waders. It is the last thing that you wanna do is to get out there, you spend all this money on tackle, you spend all this money on everything, you spent gas to get to where you wanna be, and then you step into the river and your waders leak. So I have for years started investing in higher end expensive waders. I know it's hard for some people to do, but trust me, save up three, four, five months, whatever long it takes and invest in a nice pair of waders. I really like Sims. Now again, we're not sponsored by Sims. I've used Sims for years. The reason I like Sims, quality, and they do not, the, I'm going on four years now with these with zero leaks, no pinhole leaks, no nothing. This is a four or five, I think this might even be a five layer Gore-Tex. So this is super thick material, reinforced at the knees, reinforced at every seam, super nice neoprene gravel guards, neoprene footies. One of the other things I've noticed about Sims and what makes them superior to a lot of the other brands, they just have their sizing figured out. Like when you buy a pair of waders and you look at the sizing chart, you're gonna get the right waders. And I've so many other companies that have tried to make waders, they suck at getting their sizing right. And I think it's because Sims just has so many years of domain knowledge of understanding different body types. The other cool things about Sims is if you're a big dude, say you wear a size 20 shoe, they will custom make a pair of waders for you. So you can get a hold of them, they have a custom department, and they can make custom waders for you. Sims, you owe me some money for this promotion. So I also like a, a breathable wader. You can get neoprene, like say you're fishing in a lot of like super, super cold, snowy, you're in the Midwest. A lot of those guys will use neoprene waders just because of that, you get that much war more warmth. But I hate the, the non-mobility. Having a breathable wader and being able to like lean down or do whatever you want to do is super, super important. The other thing that sounds dumb I will never not own a zip waiter ever again in my life. The convenience of being able to go like this when I need to take a piss is life changing. So it sounds stupid, it sounds crazy to spend that much extra money just for a zipper, but I will do it 10 times out of 10 times for the rest of my life because the convenience of having a zip waiter to me is just when you're a guy or even a girl, it's just really, really important to me. A lot of my friends don't use them, they still love them without zippers, but if you can afford it, I highly recommend getting a zip waiter. All right, let's put these bad boys on and then we're gonna keep talking about our gear. Okay, so as I'm putting these waders on here, guys, another thing I wanted to mention about Sims is 
If you're gonna invest in Sims, get the US made Sims. They have a few of their models. I think the G3s, I think the G4Zs. There's a few of their models that are still made in the US. And I don't wanna talk shit about Sims because again, I've used them and loved them for years, but a lot of their stuff that they make overseas is junk. I'm just gonna say it. I don't care what you think. It's not good. So if you're gonna spend the money on Sims and you're gonna get Sims waiters, if it was me, I would buy a US made pair and I would spend the extra money to do it. So I made a cardinal mistake. Alex is like, dude, you just got done talking about base layers and waiters and all these things and you don't even have a base layer. Are you an idiot? I am an idiot. I forgot to wear a base layer. So here's a trick that you can use if you forget and for some reason you're wearing jeans. A lot of times when you put your waiters on, your jeans are gonna get sucked up and pulled this way. So you can just ride your socks up over the top like that and make yourself a nice little fashion statement that no one's gonna see because it's underneath your waders anyway. So I would never do this on 99% of occasions, guys. It's just, I forgot my base layer that I wanted to show you guys, but uh, this is gonna work. It's gonna work. It's cool though, because I got I showed you guys another little trick that maybe a couple of you might not know, so. And then when you put them on, just like I just did right there, they slide on really nicely because you don't have your jeans getting in the way. This is the other reason I like the zip waders, guys, is when I'm putting these things on, it's so much nicer to put on a zip waiter than a, a regular one. So when you're when you're sliding your feet down in the bottom here, guys, you want to be really careful with those toe warmers. Just make sure you're not pulling those things off and they end up in the bottom of your feet. So normally I'd have my puffy on over my hoodie. I'd zip my waders up and I'd be real bundled. It's honestly not super, we're in like the 50s today, guys, so it's not like insanely cold. So I honestly don't even really need a puffy today. I'm, I'm feeling pretty comfortable the way I'm at. But most of the time, I would have a puffy on over the top of this hoodie. When you're tying your wading boots, guys, I always double knot them. You're gonna be so annoyed if they come untied out there. So always just run a little double knot on the waders. And then again, these little boot, these little neoprene boot fits are super nice. Basically like a gravel guard, so you don't get any gravel or any rocks or anything down in your boots. Okay, got my waders on. I'm bundled up. I got my toe warmers on. Last but not least, wading belt. Please, please, please do not go to the river. Do not wade rivers. Do not cross rivers without a wading belt. This truly, truly could save your life. If you fall in and water gets all the way down to your waders and fills up, you're a goner, guys. I promise you, it's gonna be tough to survive that. So this wading belt's gonna help you to make sure that the water stays out of this lower half of your waders. So you, want, you do wanna rock these things pretty tight. You wanna make sure that as you can see, that it's, it's kind of blocking. Like if I were to fall in, the water would go down here, but it's not necessarily gonna fill the bottom of my waders very quick. So it's gonna give me a little bit of time to recover if for some reason I fall. And I can tell you guys, I have fallen in the river a couple times and these wader belts not necessarily fell where I was in danger of drowning, but fell where I fell in the water enough where water got down in my waders, but never entered the bottom of my waders because the wading belt stopped it. So really, really important. Always, always have a wader belt. Last but not least, to kind of round off everything is a good rain jacket. I like a Gore-Tex rain jacket. There's a few different companies that make Gore-Tex. This is a Sims G3 or G4, I don't know what it is, but any Gore-Tex jacket is gonna be amazing. Spend the extra money. If you can afford it, spend the extra money and get Gore-Tex. If you can't, there's a lot of different options out there. We have a couple waterproof jackets on the Addicted website that are a little bit more low end, still great jackets, but you're not spending 500, 600 bucks on a jacket. I think ours are like 100 bucks. So if you wanna get something a little bit cheaper, just make sure no matter what, that you have a rain jacket with you. Cause it's the last thing you wanna do is get out here on the water and be freaking getting soaked from the rain. It will make you wanna go home a lot sooner, I promise you that. So last but not least, always have a nice rain jacket. I typically like to go with a wading jacket. As you can see, a wading jacket is a much shorter. So see how it's kinda at my waist right here? Again, because if you're gonna be crossing the river or crossing, you don't want that jacket hanging down in the water getting all soaking wet. So I typically will go with a wading jacket, one that's specifically made for wading. The other reason I like wading jackets is a lot of times they have all these nice little, all these nice little pockets to put put things or store activities in. So they're usually pretty well equipped. Also, this one has, oh, look at that, some old hand warmers. This one has felt on the inside. 
So you can put your hands in here and kind of warm up if you need to. So again, another important thing as you're hitting the river, dress warm, have a rain jacket. Okay, after you get everything kind of dressed up, now we're gonna start getting into the fishing. We're gonna start getting into what it takes to get out here and go steelhead fishing very easily. I always have two sets of tools. I am always gonna have a pair of pliers and I'm always gonna have a pair of scissors or some little nippers. So these are little braid leader clippers that you can get on the Addicted website. Really nice, really handy to just have clipped. But then also, obviously, you guys have heard us talk about the Gerber scissors forever. Amazing scissors. So I'm gonna use this little clip here. I'm going to put these on there. And then what I do with my, with my pliers is I put my pliers on my belt like that. And then my scissors go right into the same pocket as my pliers. And then I go through the scissor hole like that. And that's how I'm kind of rigged up. So it's just nice guys having a pair of pliers and a pair of scissors on your waist for when you're re-rigging, when you need to cut bait with the scissors, you need to release a fish, you're easily accessible to pliers, you can get down there, pop them loose and let them go. So. I wouldn't really fish guys without pliers or some sort of tool on you. It's gonna be really important when you're out there. Okay, to round off the suit, you know I gotta go Big Dave status. I started using these a couple years ago, and I think it's just because I've gone older. I'm turning into an old man, guys, I really am. But this thing right here keeps you so damn warm. The Steelhead Alley movie that's coming out this year at the Sportsman Shows, tickets available now, I'm wearing this thing like the entire time. Like I wear this, I wore this thing all hunting season at every hunting camp I went to. You're probably gonna see it in every winter steelhead video that you see this year. These damn hats are so freaking warm. It keeps the heat in your head. Really kind of helps you out there on the water to stay comfortable. Last thing I always have is a nice set of gloves. These are just a fingerless wool glove. Million different companies make them. I like to have fingerless just so I'm, when I'm tying knots or doing anything like that. It's just important. It's kind of annoying to have a pair of gloves that you don't have access to your fingers to be able to grab things with. So I'm typically always wearing a fingerless glove if I'm wearing them. So as you can see, again, I got access to all my fingers. I can tie my knots. Another thing you can do is we have like a nitrile glove that we sell on our website. You guys have seen them, the pop-off gloves. You can wear those either over the top of these and keep everything kind of dry, or you can wear them underneath. And again, it's gonna be just another layer to keep you warm on the water. Couple things I forgot about guys, hand warmers. I usually always have a couple hand warmers in my pockets here, just with my toe warmers, just a little ad added extra heat to keep me warm. And this, this is basically, a, it's called a buff or a, uh, I don't even know what it's called honestly. But, it goes around your neck, protects you from the sun, protects you from the wind, keeps you warm. A lot of times, like when I'm super cold, I'll kind of wear it over my face like that. Always, always have one of these. You're gonna never see me usually fishing at all without one of these around my neck. Just kind of seals the heat in there. You can get them everywhere. Damn near every company makes them, so highly recommend them for sure. Okay guys, I'm going to talk about the easiest way, in my opinion, to get out fishing, and that is float fishing. So we're gonna start with the rod. This is a GSP 992 ML. It's a six to 12, nine and a half foot float rod. The nice thing I like about this rod is even though it's made to float fish, you can use this thing for spinners, you can cast spoons with it. It's just a good all around rod to start with. As you can see, this is brand new. Huge shout out to our sponsor, Okuma. We love those guys and we love their rods. Limited lifetime warranties, had very, very good luck with them. Been sponsored by them for literal years. So I don't think Okuma's going anywhere in our books. We're gonna cut these tags off here. Always keep your garbage, guys. Don't leave your damn garbage on the bank. It's one thing I can say to all you addicts out there, us as addicts in this addicted community, or if you're watching this video, we should be the examples. We should be picking up garbage. We should be, if we see garbage on the bank, pick it up. If you bring garbage with you, take it out. Let's all make an effort this year in 2024 and beyond to just pick up our damn trash and pick up other people's as well and make the river a better place for everyone. Don't leave this on there. If you're one of those guys that leaves this on your rod, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to say about you. 
Always take that thing off. It's bad luck. It's bad juju if you leave that thing on there. Okay, so this is a float rod. As your float fishing guys, you can use anywhere from a 9.9 all the way up to like, some guys are using 13 footers. I like like a 9.9 to a 10 and a half, somewhere in that zone. It's gonna get you where you need to be. You need a longer rod when you're float fishing or even when you're spoon or spinner fishing to be able to hold that line up off the water and really control what you're doing. So as I, I got my rod here, I got my reel. This is an ITX 3000. So I'm typically liking anywhere from a 3000 to a 4000 series. And every rod manufacturer names these things with different numbers. It's either gonna be like a 30 series or a 40 series, or it's gonna be a 3000 or a 4000. That's usually the two that they use. So anywhere between three and four is gonna be the size you want. I like a 3000 just cause I'm using these rods specifically just for steelhead fishing and tributaries. So I don't need a lot, a bigger reel. This is gonna handle exactly what I need. So you're gonna see here, it's got this little slot. You're gonna shove that up in there. And then this just tightens onto the reel. You're just gonna keep tightening that until it stops. And I always like to get a nice, good set of my small muscles on that thing. And there you go, you're dialed. So the nice thing I like about the 3000, as you see Alex pan down the tip of the rod, Okuma does a really, really good job. Look at that. I'm balancing that on one finger. If you use a heavier reel like a 4000, it's gonna be a little bit weighted this way. So if you use the right reel and you pair the right reel with the right rod, the balance is gonna be key, which is gonna help you as you're out fishing just for fatigue. You're gonna be surprised when you're out on the river and you're fishing all day, holding your rod and casting, 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 you will get a little fatigue. So having the right balance and the right reel, rod and reel is gonna be super important. Again, Okuma ITX, Okuma Guide Select Pro. Check them out at any of your local retailers. And again, shout out to Okuma. Now we're gonna talk about the business end. And I brought something that a lot of you guys have heard us talk about. And the reason I brought this, you don't have to get these. You don't even have to use these. I could care less. But if you're just getting into fishing, it is such an easy way to just get out on the water and have every single thing you, I didn't bring anything. I brought a rod, a reel, and this, that's it. This is our Addicted Winter Chrome Kit. Now, when I take this box, this little piece of cardboard off here, and I open this up, this comes with two floats, a bunch of different jigs, a bunch of different jig heads, some of our Addicted Steelhead Worms, another float, you got 40 pound Addicted Enforcer Braid, 15 pound fluorocarbon leader, and a nice little sticker that we're gonna put on the top of the box. So step one, before you go fishing at all, you gotta get your Addicted sticker put on the box. I mean, come on guys, come on. Look at that dude. Talk about chrome skis. So step one, guys, is we gotta get some braided line on this reel. So we're always using braid. There's a couple reasons, right? It lasts forever. You can put braid on a reel and you can use it for a couple seasons and it's gonna be dialed. The main factor is, guys, very low stretch, a lot of line pickup. So when you pick up that line and go to set the hook from far distances, that hook's gonna really sink into that fish. But the number one reason is it floats. When you're float fishing or doing any of this fishing out here on the river, you want that braid to lay on top of the on the water and be able to control your float a lot better. So, the other thing I like about these Okuma reels is most reels need electrical tape. These Okuma reels come with this nice little like textured piece in there so you don't have to electrical tape your line when you're spooling it up. Now guys, I'm gonna be the first one to tell you I am not the best at doing this. I don't have any special little cool tricks or methods or anything spectacular that I do. I literally am gonna take this braided line. I'm going to go here and I'm just gonna tie a couple square knots, nothing crazy, just a couple basic knots and get that line tight around that spool. Usually three times is gonna be plenty. Just like so. Then you're gonna get in here with your snippers. 
I'm gonna snip that as close to that knot as you can. Like that, and again, don't leave this on the river, throw it in your box. You're gonna flip that bale over, and then what you're gonna do, is as you can see, I'm holding tension on this line. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold tension as I start to reel this onto the reel. You don't need to go super fast. You just get that thing on there nice and tight. Just how we like it. This spool, guys, is gonna come with 150 yards of line. So you should be able to get most of the spool onto your, onto your reel. So as you guys can see, I'm pretty close to the edge here. That's a right about where you want to be. If you overspool it, if you put too much line on this reel, you are going to have a nightmare of tangles. It is going to be bad. So that's about as far as you want to go on that spool, and it's going to be plenty of line. If a steelhead spools you that much, you better chase him. You better run after him, because they shouldn't be able to get that much line off your reel. So that's going to look real nice, and that's about where I'm going to want it. So what I'm gonna do is, once I get it there to how I like it, I'm gonna just pull off another, I don't know, that much line, and then I'm gonna cut it. And this rest of this line, guys, that's on there, there's not much you can really do with it. It's 125 yards. You're not gonna have enough to really spool another rod. So I don't know what you can use it for, but we got some extra braid. So we got some 15 pound tough line fluorocarbon. We're gonna tie this to our braid with what's called a uni knot. Condition dependent, we do have super clear water today. So normally guys, I would use a little bit lighter line. I'd probably go 12 pound fluorocarbon, but you can get away with 15. There's some monster fish in this river. So the last thing you want to do is hook the fish of your lifetime and not be able to land it because you have too light a leader. So I'm typically never going lower than 12 and never going more than 20. So just get into those range. I usually have spools in my backpack ranging from 12 all the way to 20. I'm going to usually pull off four to five feet typically of leader. That's what you want to start with. I like these tough line spools because once you're done there, you just flip these back over. It's kind of nice and it holds your line in there so you don't have to worry about a little keeper or anything. So I'm gonna cut off about four to five feet. You take your fluorocarbon from one side, you're going to loop that. You're gonna grab it. You're gonna wrap that back through. I typically like to do five or six times. Four. There we go. Then I'm gonna wet that knot. You always wanna wet your fluorocarbon knots. You never want it to burn on itself. It's really, really important. Okay, so once you have the fluorocarbon tied on that side, you're gonna take the braid and you're gonna do the exact same thing, guys. You're gonna grab that braid from that side. You're going to loop it like so, and then you're gonna wrap it back through five or six times. One, two, three, four, oh, 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 five. Then as you see, you're gonna pull that tight. Don't let it loop on itself. Just pull that tight like so, and then you're gonna pull these two together. That's gonna form your knot. There you have it. The double uni. Now, take your little snippers. You're gonna cut these as close to this knot as you can without cutting the line. And the key is, guys, you don't want anything hanging off there because anything extra that you have hanging off is gonna get caught in your eyes as you're casting. Grab those two tag ends, throw them, in the, throw them in the garbage, throw them in your box, wherever. And now, you have what's called a floral carbon bumper. And basically what it is, four to five feet of line, so that way the fish doesn't see your braid in the water. So now we gotta decide what we wanna put on the business end. And I think guys, I mean, you guys know me, you may or you may not, but I'm putting a worm on. We're going hunting. We're going hunting for a big boy today. So. 
what we're gonna do first is we gotta do our float. I'm gonna go with the orange float. So we make three different colors of this. We make an orange, we make a pink, we make a chartreuse. I highly recommend the pink or the orange on bright days. If you have bright days where the sun's gonna be in your face or you just really need to see this extremely well, use pink or orange. On really cloudy days like today, honestly, you can get away with using chartreuse. You can see how much that thing just looks electric right now. But knowing that it's gonna be sunny over the next few days that I'm gonna be fishing, I'm gonna go ahead and go with orange. So guys, this is our addicted Mustad fixed float. Now the way this float works is it is a system. As you can see, it's got these little weights on the bottom. As you take that weight off, it's got a weight and an O-ring. Also, in the internal base of the float, it has a weight that's inset into the float for balance. So what this float does is it allows you to fish all the way down to 100, 130 seconds, all the way up to a quarter ounce. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna adjust the weights on the base of the float depending on what you're fishing. So because I know today I'm gonna be fishing an eighth ounce worm, I'm just gonna go with one weight. So I'm gonna put my weight back on there. But again, if you're fishing a 30 second ounce, you might need three of these weights. Because the idea is, is you want this float to track in the water as natural as possible. The reason we designed this float like this is because if you don't have enough weight and your float's sitting too high in the water, your stuff's gonna be moving down the current way too quick. It's not gonna move naturally down the river. As it sucks down in the water, it slows your presentation a little bit, and this float's gonna track with the current as natural as possible. Really, really important, guys, when you're fishing for steelhead. Cam always likes to say steelhead are some of the stupidest fish ever. It's not a lie. Steelhead are actually really easy to trick, but you have to be natural. You have to make your stuff look like it's something they've seen in the river. If it looks too unnatural, you ain't gonna catch it. Okay, so the float's also gonna come with two pieces of surgical tube and some extras. What this is for is to affix, that's right, affix, because it's a fixed float, your float to the line. So the first thing you're gonna do, you're gonna put that first piece of surgical tube onto your leader. And then what you're gonna do is you're going to run this leader through this hole. What this hole's for, guys, is if for some reason your top and bottom surgical tubing breaks, you don't lose your float. It's still gonna be on your line, you're not gonna lose your float. So I always like to wet this a little bit, so I'm gonna dip that in the water, and then I'm gonna slide that first piece of surgical tube down over the top. Like so. And then same for the bottom of the float. Take your surgical tube, you're gonna slide that up the line, dip that in, slide that tube on the bottom one, and there you have it. As you can see, that float, no matter which way I move it, it's stuck on the line. But the nice thing is, is if you need to adjust your depth quickly, you just slide it up or slide it down. Slide it up or slide it down. I'm gonna show you that a little bit more when I'm fishing. This is one of the other reasons I like a fixed presentation. So guys, we're in a river right now that's very low, very clear, not a lot of flow. There's no need for a big sliding flow with a big massive weight and just a bunch of extra stuff that's really just gonna scare the fish. So I'm gonna use a fixed float right down to my jig head, right to my worm. So we got our worm jig heads. These, again, guys, super unique. They It sounds weird, but we did some things on these worm jig heads that not a lot of other people had done before. So everyone knows what a Ned rig is when they're bass fishing, right? A lot of the Ned rigs have a flat base on the jig head. We thought, why is no one doing that for steelhead? It's the same concept. So that's exactly what we did. We got the Ned rig style head so your worm's gonna sit flush up. We added the Kevin Van Dam Keeper, which I'm gonna show you in a second. The other thing that we did that makes these really unique and awesome for worm fishing is look how long that shank is. From the head to there, you have an extremely long hook shank. What that does is it gets the back of that hook farther back on the worm. You miss a lot less bites when they go to bite that, bite that worm. So we're gonna tie this on here with just a basic fisherman's knot. I just like to wrap six or seven times and go right back through. It's just a clinch knot. It's done well for me. I've never had many issues with it. Six, seven times wrap, back through the loop, 
wet your line, snug that thing down. As you can see, I'm pulling on that real tight, ain't going anywhere. Now I'm gonna cut that tag end off. Then we're gonna grab our worms. As you can see, this is the uh, Red Fever, which is available on the Addicted website. It's basically like a pearlescent red color with a white tail, and it's money. Caught a lot of fish on this, guys, with a black jig head. Okay, guys, so as you see, when you pull these things out, you're gonna get a six inch worm. And there's a collar right here, guys. Let me hold this. You can see that little soft part of the worm that's not ribbed? That's where we're gonna cut. We're gonna take that worm, we're gonna cut that collar off. Just like so. And then you can use these for anything else. I know a lot of guys that cut these up into little chunks and send them for kokanee. I mean, really, you can use this for a lot of different scenarios. And then we're gonna take our worm here. We are going to thread this sucker up the line. Make sure you're right in the center. And then when I get this thing to where I feel like it's got a full turn in it, see how that thing's got like a full turn? I'm gonna pop it out the bottom and I'm again, make sure it's centered. And then you're gonna start to work that up over the keeper. And there you have it. So that keeper again, it's gonna, if this thing's, it's just gonna hold that worm on that head nicely. And as you can see why we made it the Nedrick style, cause look at how flat and clean and nice that looks. Again, key guys is natural. And the naturaler you can make your presentation, the better chance you have of catching a fish. So I have a worm on here guys. You 100% absolutely, if you want, you can use a jig. This is one of our Sink It Series jigs. Super, super high quality, nice jigs. We got them in a million different colors. What's on the business end below your float? You can use jigs, you can use bait, you can use worms. There's a array of things you can use on these presentations. Like I said, guys, in the description below, I am going to have a catalog of videos for you so you can keep studying and understanding how to steal fish. So I'll have a lot of stuff in there talking about bait, talking about beads, talking about all that. So make sure you guys check the description. There's gonna be a lot of other education that you guys can go through and watch to help you catch fish out there. Okay guys, so now let's talk about fishing a little bit. Again, like I said, I'm not gonna go insanely in depth on the fishing part, guys, because I'm gonna have a bunch of links down below where you guys can go through and get more in depth on how to actually fish these presentations. But I did wanna slightly cover it. The main point of this video is to give you guys all the little nuggets of information leading up to the fishing. So, but as you get out here, I'm gonna just go through some basics. So one of the things when you're float fishing, as you adjust your presentation, right? always start shallow and then work deep. So my first couple casts, I'm, I'm only gonna run it about three feet deep. And the reason I'm gonna do that is you don't wanna go into the hole and cast, have your stuff set at 10 feet and be dragging your presentation through the hole because it's gonna spook fish away. So always start shallow and always start in. You know, what happens if the steelhead decides he's sitting right here at the bank? Well, if you cast way the hell over him, for one, you're casting over the fish, you're not even gonna have a chance at him. For two, there's a good chance you might spook it. So, so your first cast, guys, I'm just gonna pitch it out there. I'm not gonna go very far, and I'm gonna go slightly up river. I'm gonna go right on this inside. As soon as that float hits the water, put that rod in the air. Keep that line off of the water. The last thing you want is that line getting sucked down and sucking your float into a non-natural presentation. As the float's coming down with you, just reel up the slack. Keep that slack reeled up. Don't want a ton of line on the water if you don't have to. So show the float now, Alex. As you can see, the float's kind of getting down below me. So as the float gets down below me, I'm gonna flip my bail over and I'm just gonna start letting line out. I'm gonna let that float just naturally work with the current. I'm gonna keep my hand kind of right here to control the line. And then as I feel like, okay, it's gone down there too far, I'm gonna reel it up. Now again, your next cast, go another 10 feet out and repeat the exact same thing. So I'm gonna go about 10 feet out here, from where I was, rod in the air just like so. As that float's coming down, if you get too much line going in front of you, reel that thing up, and this is what's called mending. You're gonna take that line, pick that rod up, 
you're gonna put that line behind the float. You always wanna keep that line, if you can, behind the float, because if not, the current will grab it and it'll swing that float inwards and you won't get a natural presentation. Again, got my hand off the thing. I'm letting some line out here. Once I feel like, okay, it's gone too far down there, I don't feel comfortable with that hook set. I have a fish. I have a fish on. I have a fish on. Guys, we have a fish. We have a fish. Are you kidding me right now? I was not expecting to hook anything, guys. We are insanely early right now. This river doesn't typically see fish until January, I mean, February, really. We have a fish, guys. As I was teaching you, you probably saw the surprise on my face. I told Alex not to film the bobber. I'm like, dude, we're not gonna get any bobber downs. Don't film the bobber. And I just got a bobber down and we got a fish on, boys and girls. So, as you can see, you can be extremely successful out here doing these techniques if you put it all to good use. So hopefully we can land this thing. Oh, it's a beautiful fish. It is a beauty, guys. It is a beautiful fish. We have to see this thing. He is fighting upriver right now, guys. He's fighting upriver. This is a really good fish. Holy crap, guys. I can't believe that just happened. Definitely a steelhead. It might be a summer. Dude. No, it's chrome, dude. It's yeah. a winner. It's a winner. Are you kidding me, dude? Oh, let's go, addicts! Oh, there he goes! You gotta be kidding me! You gotta be kidding me! That was a dime winner, guys. Oh, man. Well, what a freaking heartbreaker. But also really awesome for you guys to see that because you guys can see I just literally, I went from a bare rod to a bare reel to reeling and putting everything and setting everything up and my third, ca second cast in, right? Or third? Second. Well, either way, we just showed you guys, if you put the effort in, you do things right, you go to the right river locations, you can be successful. Now, I didn't land that, but it doesn't matter because that was really, really cool, guys. That was cool. All right, guys. Well, there you have it. I want to thank you guys so much for tuning into our videos. We appreciate you so much. Hopefully that taught some of you beginning anglers out there some new information. And hopefully some of you seasoned anglers learn some things as well. If you want to see more videos, and like I said, I have a bunch of links in the description. All sorts of educational stuff as it pertains to winter steelhead season. I hope you guys have an absolute amazing year. I hope you catch the fish of your dreams. And hopefully, we'll see you on the river.